some hands raised if you can hear clearly. If you can see the screen that says Bricado Color Project Color Basics, just raise your hand so we can get some ideas. Chad, thank you. Make sure that everybody's Lena, great. Ryan, appreciate that. Cool. We will assume that everyone is able to hear and uh, is ready to go forward with our Bricado Color Basics class. It's a great pleasure this afternoon to welcome Jesse Skittrell. As I said, Jesse's been with us for a number of years in various capacities. And at this point in time, he's a successful Bricado Diamond Salon owner and uses Bricado products exclusively in his salon, as well as does education for us in the Northwest. So we're happy to welcome Jesse and have him be the leader for our webinar today. Um, Michelle, do you have anything you'd like to say or any, any warm up welcomes? Well, yeah, actually, I just wanted to say thank you all for attending. Um, we're going to have about an hour to an hour and a half worth of in-depth conversation about Mercado Color Project um, color. And uh, we, I, like Gary said, we just wanted to mix it up a little bit. You guys hear me an awful lot, and you hear Gary, and we, we just thought we'd change it up a little bit and let you, you know, hear a little bit from Jesse. So um, with that, I just want to, I'm going to just turn it over to Jesse. I just want to thank you guys for attending. And we will take some questions at the end. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot them at us. Um, Gary and I can both answer questions um, online. Um, or you can save it to the end, and we'll open it up for questions after the webinar, as well as if you have some specific things or more in-depth questions that you want to talk to us live about. Um, so with that, Jesse, it's all yours. Beautiful. Good morning. I hope everybody's doing okay. Um, to those that are in the East, I wish you the best with Hurricane yeah. Sandy. This is going to be kind of messy. So please try to stay warm and try to stay dry. Um, as Gary said, my name is Jesse Skittrell, and I am a network educator for Bricado in the Pacific Northwest. I am a salon owner. I have nine stylists in my salon, and we are a Bricado Diamond Salon. We use Bricado day in, day out. We live it, breathe it. If you cut me, you know, super soak comes out of my body, and color comes out of my other arm. So with that being said, what we wanted to do today with Color Basics is really delve into everything that's in your toolbox with Bricado Color Project and what the capabilities are and how to use them within the confines of their design. So to start off with, we really like to discuss um, the vision behind the hair color and Sam Bricado and what he was thinking when he did this. What most people don't understand about hair color is when you are a shampoo company, a lot of times when a shampoo company says, hey, all of a sudden I want to make hair color, they take a generic hair color formula, they slap a brand on, name on top of it, and they throw it out into the world and call it their hair color. And that really wasn't the idea here when Sam developed Color Project. Sam really wanted something that he built from the ground up, making sure that he paid attention to and that it fit within the brand. So Bricado Color Project is brand new. It is built from the ground up and it is very well thought through and it really takes the hairdresser's brain into thought when uh, he designed it. One of the first things that we'll talk in depth about a little bit later is low ammonia odor. odor. This is one of the key things that really sets Bricado Color Project apart from everything else and I'm going to expound on that a little bit later. The second is, this is German inspired but American made. For those of us that have been doing hair color for an extended period of time, one of the things that we noticed when designing the hair color was that German hair color has a tendency to dominate or the brain that goes into the design that's behind it. So that was kind of where we were coming from, for those of you that are familiar with us, it was the German brain, but it is definitely American made and made here in the United States and made with American ideals behind it and the, and the way it's designed. It's completely completely predictable. So what you see is what you get. The swatch book has been incredibly designed to be very predictable so that you can use the permanent and demi-permanent collectively. The performance is really next generation. It's been very well thought through from the base to the alkalizer all the way through to the pigments but as well as how it performs behind the chair. Durable, long-lasting results. Again, the design that's put into this really creates durable, long-lasting, shiny, healthy results. It's all about, if you know Sam or you've worked with Bricado for an extended period of time, there's one thing that he really takes into consideration, and that's respecting the hair, leaving the shine, and making sure that the results last and they're very hair hairdresser-friendly. So healthy, uncompromised hair at the end of the day. 
our permanent hair color matches our demi-permanent, which is very important for those of us that work in the salon on a day-in, day-out basis. I know a lot of times I start my guests with demi-permanent hair color. Once they become a custom, we move them into permanent hair color, and the fluidity of that is really incredible with the name and number system matching, and it truly matches from permanent to demi-permanent as well. And for those of us that are space challenged, or if you're a booth runner, there is single inventory options. So rather than having absolutely everything in the line, you, there really is an option that helps you pare down your inventory and gain control over it. At the end of the day, this is really cutting edge hair color. I, we have, my team has been so inspired by this and having such a phenomenal, phenomenal results with this. They really do feel like it's cutting edge color and it really is designed that way. So let's jump into it. One of the things that we want to do first is go through the laws of color real quickly and the physics of hair. And there's some things that we're trained as hair colorists that set us up for failure when we're talking about hair color. So the first one that we want to go through is the law of hair color. And I just want to define a few things. I know this is probably information that most of us have heard over a period of time, but I just want to throw a few key things in there and really draw your attention to a few things. So when we're talking about hair color, we've all, from our kindergarten days on up, learned about primary colors. Primary colors are really the primary purest forms, the strongest and most influential pigments that we have. They cannot be created by any other colors. Um, these are the basics that combine every other color that's out there. And the three basic primaries, blue, red, and yellow. Very simple, straightforward. I think we all have that. So when we talk about primary colors, the first one that we have to talk about is blue. Blue is the darkest and the most dominant and the only cool primary hair color. Anytime that you add blue to hair color, it creates depth. Blue deepens and darkens. It is the heaviest pigment weight and the largest molecular size. So a little bit of blue added to any of your formula darkens and dominates things very quickly. And this is also the easiest to eliminate because it sits closest to the cuticle when we're talking about artificial hair color. The second color that we have to talk about is red. And red is a medium weighted color and it is the brightest and the most reflective hair color that we have in the, in the family. And it's the strongest warm color and it's the one that we react the strongest to when we're talking about artificial hair color. And it produces the most richness in our hair color. And it is also one of those that's a little bit more difficult to remove because it's positioned a little further into the hair shaft and you have to expand that hair shaft a little bit wider and for a long enough period to eliminate the red molecule out of the hair. That takes us down to yellow and yellow is the smallest in weight and the lightest. And so it's the brightest and warmest primary color that we have. When you add yellow to anything, it brightens and lightens everything. Even if you physically haven't lightened something, you add yellow to the formula and it creates that highlighted dimensional effect to the hair. This one's also the most difficult to remove. Artificial yellow hair color is the one that's used the most in hair color and the heaviest and the strongest and it sits the furthest into the hair shaft, making it really the most difficult hair color to remove. I don't know about you guys, but I've watched artificial hair color go through that blue, that red stage, that orange stage, and all of a sudden sit at that yellow stage for extended periods of time before it moves on. So we know when we take those primary colors and we mix them in equal proportions, we create secondary colors. So when we take red and yellow mixed together, we create orange. When we take blue and yellow, Ziploc says, we create green. When we take red and blue together, we create violet. And a key word there is violet, not purple. This is a medium weighted co combination of red and blue. And when you begin to layer that on top of itself, it gets darker, it becomes purple. Purple becomes indigo at that point. So this is the medium weighted version of red and blue mixed together. Those secondary colors are really a combination of the two primary colors mixed together. And they're less strong than the primary, their primary counterparts. So the law of complementary color is very simple and straightforward. Each primary color that we come in, com in, in contact with has a secondary color across the color wheel. When you mix the two of those together, it gives you your red, yellow, and blue combination creating brown. I think the law of complementary color is the first thing that we learn in hair color class when we talk about yellow hair, cross from it is violet, the combination of the two. If you have too much red, you apply green. If you have too much orange in the hair, you apply a blue shade. So the reason we make such a big deal out of complementary hair color is when we're trained 
on what creates brown in the hair. We're trained to believe that it's all three parts of red, yellow, and blue, but it's equal parts by weight. If blue weighs the most, you would need one part blue, red is medium, two parts red, and three parts yellow. The reason I make such a big deal about that is really that's what our job is at the end of the day is to create brown. So if we boil down what hair color we're seeing in front of us as to how much red, blue, or yellow is in the hair and just look for what's missing or what needs to be added to make the finished result that we're looking for, it becomes much more simplistic for us. So one part blue, two parts red, three parts yellow makes a balanced neutral or natural brown. So that's the law of color, pretty simple and straightforward. I think we've all heard that a million times. Just like to visit it just to make sure that we're all there. And then that takes us into a conversation about hair composition. And when we talk about hair composition, there's really three basic parts to the hair that we've all been, been trained on, cuticle, cortex, and medulla. So the first part that we wanna talk about is the medulla. The medulla is the hair's core. It's comprised of a spongy soft keratin, has no useful function, and a lot of times it's actually absent in fine hair strands. It actually is a viscous substance in the center core of the hair. It never really actually hardens. Therefore, people with fine hair a lot of times don't have this as well. The second structure is the cortex. The cortex, it forms 90% of the hair's bulk. This is where the texture and elasticity comes from. This is also where the melanin granules are located or in the cortex of the hair. The cortex is basically microfibers and macrofibers that are intertwined very similar to a rope inside the internal structure of the hair. In between those microfibers and macrofibers is a substance called intercellular binding material. That material is very important to note because we're going to talk about it a little bit later and how Sam really took that into play when he was designing the hair color because a lot of times people don't take that into consideration. And then the last structure that we have to talk about is the cuticle. The cuticle is translucent by nature, meaning that light transfers through it very readily. So it's not necessarily transparent as much as it is translucent. So remember when your beauty school instructor beat you up over the fact that when hair color is wet, you should never judge it till it's dry. That holds true even more dynamically with Bricado because of the fact that the color is sitting in the hair, not on the hair. So what you're going to see when it's wet versus when it's dry looks completely different. The cuticle consists of up to six to eight layers of overlapping cells and when they're flat obviously they're going to be healthy and shiny. The cuticle is really our first line against defense and this is really where the, the incredible shine comes from in the hair. The one thing that's worth noting here when we talk about the cuticle is if you take a look at the cross section of the hair and you look at the cuticle from the top down We've all been trained to believe that we open and close the cuticle of the hair. If you look at the cross section of the cuticles, the way that they're overlaid, and you look down on it, you'll find that they really look like a maze. So you're not really just opening the door and getting instant access. You actually are having to work through a maze. So when we talk about color going into the hair, we have to work through that maze-like structure of the cuticle before we actually get to the cortex, which can prove to be a little bit difficult or a little bit time-consuming, or color sits a lot of times in just that cuticle area. That takes us into a conversation about melanin, and there's two basic two types of melanin that we work with, eumelanin and melanin. and these structures, again, are ingrained in the cortex of the hair. The melanin structure itself, starting with eumelanin, is a black to deep red pigment that gives the hair its dark color. This one's the largest melanin structure. It looks like a long grain of rice under, underneath a microscope. When we apply an alkalizer to the hair, this is the melanin structure that's actually dispersed into the hair. So we break that melanin cell down and it actually spreads throughout the hair, causing light to be reflected back differently to our eyeballs. The second structure is fail melanin. Fail melanin, it looks like the head of a pin. It's much smaller and it is responsible for those red to pale yellow pigments in the hair that give the hair shaft its warm hair colors. And especially in those lighter hair colors, we're going to see a lot of fail melanin built in. This structure is much harder to break down because of its size being much smaller. So we've all experienced that opportunity where we lighten the hair to yellow and then it just sits there and waits because we're having to break down that fail melanin pigment in the hair and causing it to disperse through about the hair shaft. Again, I think it's worth stressing here, when we work with naturally occurring melanin or pigment structures, you're really not bleaching anything out of the hair shaft. What you're doing is breaking down the melanin structure, dispersing it through the hair, and it reflects light back differently. 
I'm going to come back to that here in a moment. Here's where it really becomes very important. In dark hair, now every structure of hair on the planet has both these melanins in some form or another. In dark hair, the concentration of eumelanin is going to be greater and the actual pigment size itself is larger. I want to say that again. In dark hair, the concentration of eumelanin is going to be greater and the pigment size itself is actually larger. In light hair, the concentration of eumelanin is going to be less and the pigment size is going to be smaller. This is where I find hairdressers get into a pickle because they're not able to look at a head of hair that's sitting in the chair and decide how it's going to lift or what the underlying pigment is. So start here as your first line of defense in understanding that the eumelanin itself size-wise is going to be a little bit smaller or larger depending upon your starting level where you're at. If more melanin is present, the hair is going to be darker. If less melanin is present, the hair is naturally going to be a little bit lighter. So one of the things that we talk about over and over and over again is texture. And we're going to expand a little bit more on texture here in a moment and bring back that conversation. One of the things that we really like to strive for is gray hair versus white hair. And one of the things that happens as we get older and our bodies produce less melanin, gray hair is a combination of the pigmented and unpigmented hair. So really what's happened in gray hair is the pigment production has not stopped. It's just not visually seeable by the naked eye. So you have certain spots in that gray hair where production has stopped, certain spots where pigment production is still going on, making it much more coarse and much more difficult to cover. And that combination of pigmented and unpigmented hair sitting next to each other is what gives it that gray reflection. There's no real gray hair happening there versus white hair. As we get a little bit older, gray hair eventually becomes white. White hair becomes very absorbent. So if you've experienced that client, you've done her hair color for a million years and you use 6N or 6-0 and 20 volume on her hair, you do that retouch and all of a sudden one day the hairline looks a little bit smoky or a little bit ashy or flat or takes a little bit darker. It's probably because she's gone from being a gray structure to being a white structure and you just have to approach it a little bit differently. And this is why I like to go over the physiology of hair beforehand so that you really understand what you're working on when you make the informed decision to put Bricado Color Project on it. So gray hair production, gray hair pigment production is still happening. It's just not seeable to the eye. White hair, the pigment production has actually stopped and it becomes much more absorbent. A great example of that to illustrate that one last time is if you've bleached gray hair it turns yellow because the pigment production is still there. It's just now becoming visible because of the alkalinity of the hair. If you did that to white hair, it would simply stay white. So just know what you're working on when you're working on it. Some of the hair characteristics that we have to talk about, um, the first one is texture. We were talking about texture a little bit earlier. Really hair comes in three different categories. You have a fine, medium and a coarse texture. The finer the hair is, the easier it's going to be to lighten. The coarser the hair is, the harder it's going to be to lighten. So some of the characteristics we have to take a look at is also uptake of color. The thicker the diameter of the hair is, the more melanin is going to be present. So therefore fine hair lightens quickly and it appears more translucent. Coarse hair is going to be more difficult to lighten and the final color result will look deeper and richer because there's more physical structure for the hair to actually hold on. So one of the reasons we make such a big deal about this is when you are looking at your finished formula you want to, or what you want to achieve, you want to take into consideration before anything else what is the texture of the hair because the uptake of color or its ability to lighten is going to be dramatically affected by that. and want to really take that into consideration almost more importantly than level is going to be to the hair. So texture, 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 and then texture, and if I didn't say it, think about texture. Tenacity refers to the ability of the cuticle to be penetrated, and we were talking about earlier that cuticle being six to eight layers deep. Each head is going to be a little bit different. Obviously the coarser the hair is, the more cuticle you're going to be coming in contact with. Typically, the finer the hair is, the less cuticle you're going to be coming in contact with. The shinier the cuticle is, the more resistant it's going to be. The less shine that the cuticle has, the more open it's going to be and the more it's going to uptake of color and the easier it is going to be to get in contact with that cortex and make a change.
one of the things that is worth noting here is porosity. And porosity um, typically is taught as the hair's ability to absorb moisture, aka water. And while that is true, there really is about four grades of porosity. So as a colorist, I really highly encourage you to get comfortable grading porosity on a scale of one to four. One being resistant glassy texture to the hair, resists chemicals. We really don't come in contact with the hair a whole heck of a lot, um, especially with the flat ironing that's going on and chemical exposure to the hair. A grade two porosity is going to be somebody that has a little bit of lift to the cuticle. It's moderately healthy. It really doesn't need conditioner to comb it out. Grade three porosity is going to be that client that has probably had a chemical service and it requires conditioning to be able to get a comb through it, but it doesn't detangle back up again. Grade four porosity is when you put, apply a detangler to it, you detangle it, and it still retangles on its own very easily, meaning the cuticle has been lifted excessively, and it's going to suck up pretty much everything that comes around it. And grade five porosity is that hair that you just pick up off the floor. The, the cuticle is pretty much gone, and there's really no salvaging that kind of hair. So you want to get really comfortable grading the hair on a scale of one to four. Where are they at in that porosity game? Be the higher the porosity, the more readily it's going to absorb color, but also the more readily it's going to release color as well. Grade three porosity is probably the most common that we work on grade two and grade three. Grade four, you have to take some extreme measures such as repigmentizing the hair. Grade five, just cut it off. There's nothing that's really going to save it at that point. Also have to take into consideration keratinization. And since hair is, pro is protein and it hardens as it's exposed to oxygen as it grows out from the head, it's very similar to your fingernails. If you have natural nails and you push at the tip of the nail, you're going to find it's very hard and inflexible. If you push back by the cuticle of the nail, you're going to see that it's very soft and very flexible. Hair goes through that same process. Hair that is closest to the scalp is less keratinized and softer, and hair that is closer to the ends has been exposed to oxygen more it's going to be a little bit harder and a little bit more difficult to lift through. So just plug that into your brain when you're formulating color. We've all been forced to think in terms of scalp heat as one layer of reason that the scalp lifts. Soft keratinization is also another reason. So you'll find when we do the case studies that we have some different formulations going on for scalp versus ends because we're taking into consideration keratinization in the hair. All right, so that's kind of a real quick overview of the law of color, the physiology of hair, and how it affects the uptake of color. Just wanted to throw that out there before we actually get into um, the color project and how it actually works. And so now we'll go into the uses of all the tools that are in the toolbox from permanent, demi-permanent, all the way down to our lights as well as our color refresher and then our support products as well. So one of the first things you'll do if you happen to have the swatch book close to you, just give it a quick open and you'll notice that we use a level system, the European level system of 1 through 10. The darker the color the number is, the darker the color is going to be, the lighter, the higher the number is, the lighter the color is going to be. So obviously a level 1 is going to be black all the way on up to our level 10 which is going to be our pastel blonde. So we use that numbering system just to denote. Now one of the things that I really like to drive home with colorists is not all level systems are created equal. So please make sure and get your eye geared towards the level system using Bricado Color Project versus other level systems. The most common phone call I get is, well it's not a true level 5. Well every company gets to design their level 5 hair color. So our level 5 is in our world. So make sure that you gear your eye towards what we have going on. So when you take a look at the numbers in the, in the book, the European level system, you're going to see the first number you see is going to be the level which determines how light or how dark the color is going to be. And then you're going to hear stroke, slash, or dash, and that second number is going to correspond to tone. So here's a really great example of that. Here's a level 7, medium blonde then you're going to hear, hear that stroke slash dash and we have both the Americanized tonality system and the European tonality system directly behind that. Just gives you a real quick frame of reference. So what we've done is with that level 7 
is we put that stroke there and then we correspond the numbering system behind it. And one of the reasons for that, especially in a European based system, is going to be the fact that we don't have to learn a whole bunch of lettering systems. So great, great example of that is 7A here in the United States means ash, 7A in Germany might mean uh, Auburn. We've got a little bit of a problem. So since numbers are the most universal system, we've assigned each of the tonalities a number that corresponds on the color wheel as well. So I want to walk you through what the 10 tonalities are because when you open up the book it gets a little bit daunting to see all of those numbers. So I'm going to show you how all of them mix and match and create um, a colorful wheel for you. So the first one you're going to see is stroke zero. Stroke zero is neutral or natural. It's located in the center of the color wheel. It is the most balanced brown that you're going to possibly get. This is ideal for gray coverage. The generic rule that I like to tell people is match the percentage of gray to the percentage of neutral or natural in your bowl. So if the client's 50% gray, 50% of your formula needs to be neutral or natural. This is going to be your background. Now notice that it's in the center of the color wheel. We're going to talk about that a little bit more extensively here in a moment. Um, the colors that are placed closer to the center of the color wheel have more brown involved with them. The colors that are closer to the edge of the color wheel are going to be more pure tone or fashion shade oriented. So that multi-pigment composition really works in our favor. So when we're trying to do gray coverage, we need that brown involved. But if I'm trying to do bright freaking screaming red or I'm trying to control warmth in the hair, I want as much pure tone in that color. I don't want brown involved in my color. So if you've ever heard somebody say, my red browned out, they're probably using a pre-blended hair color line. Or if you're having somebody that talks about their sheer gray coverage, they're probably working with pure tone. So Sam wanted to design this to have the best of both worlds. So the colors that are located in the center are more gray coverage intended or browner. The colors that are closer to the edge are going to be more pure tone or fashion shade oriented. So stroke zero is neutral or natural. Stroke one is going to be blue or ash. Now remember we were talking about living close to the center is brown, close to the edge is more pure tone. This is probably one of the key components that I really get excited about with Bricado Color Project because it's so well thought through. That stroke one is blue based, blue controls orange in the hair, but notice where it lives. It lives closer to the edge of the color wheel so it's much more pure tone or fashion shade oriented so it really has a strong amount of blue to be able to control that orange tone in the hair and I find that most people are really surprised by our stroke ones and how much they actually control the that underlying pigment or that warmth in the hair. Stroke two it's going to be green or matte. Again, a pure tone color. Green controls red in the hair. And notice that it's towards the edge of the color wheel, so it's going to give you that maximum control of that red in the hair shaft. Stroke three is gold. Now, typically as an artificial hair color manufacturer, gold comes in one of two ways. It's yellow with a hint of orange in it or it's yellow with a hint of green in it. Now when you have yellow with a hint of orange unfortunately the hair is going to lighten it it's on its own into an orange state so you add something that has yellow with a hint of orange to it you get kind of this brassy funky copper thing going on. So we've designed the gold to have just the smallest kiss of green in the color just to give it take off that edge so it's not so brassy or over the top exposed warmth and it just gives you a true soft believable gold. What you see happening in the swatch book is exactly what the result is going to be. Stroke four is your copper. Now notice that it sits slightly to the red side of the orange. It doesn't sit quite, quite on the line. They've really done a really great job of giving you an accurate representation of where every single color lives. Stroke five is red. Just balanced right, right through the middle red, not too warm, not too cool. It just it gives you that beautiful red finished result to the hair. Stroke six is violet. And violet gives you control of gold or yellow in the hair shaft. Stroke seven is an interesting one because this is a violet based brown. Again, remember we said colors that were closer to the middle of the color wheel are going to be more brown based or gray coverage intended. Stroke seven is beautiful for that. And people get thrown by the word violet based brown. And what that means simply is that there's a red contribution and 
there is also a blue contribution to it. So when you're lifting with the hair color, it can have a tendency to look a little bit like warm, but not so warm that it's red. But when you're looking to deposit, it can have that slightly cooled or those caramel effects to the hair. But it also covers up to 50% gray on its own. So it makes a great pitch hitter when you're doing gray coverage. You don't necessarily always need a neutral. You can use a stroke seven and it's very colorful and believable, especially if you get bored with doing neutral. I don't know about you guys, but I get bored of doing neutral on everybody. Stroke seven is a really great choice for that. Stroke eight is going to be violet blue. You can again see it's in the pure tone area on the edge of the color wheel. It's going to give maximum control of that yellow with a hint of orange. And then stroke nine is the exact opposite. It's blue violet. So it's going to give even more control to that orange hair that's on its way to being yellow. So you're going to be able to have maximum control and you have choice of what you want. So you can really see that there's 10 tonalities here. Once you memorize what those 10 tonalities are and how they interlock, everything else becomes much easier. So taking a look at this seven stroke seven swatch, this is a level seven medium blonde stroke seven, which is a violet based brown. So it's a medium violet, medium blonde, violet based brown. So it has that incredible warmth to it or a seven B is a great choice. It has that warmth to it, but also that second, that cool note. So that gives you that great coverage that you're looking for 50% gray coverage and really just a colorful, gorgeous pick color. So when we take again, when we take a look at the color wheel, I just want to reiterate, it's worth mentioning, shades that are closer to the center of the color wheel are going to be more pre-blended or brown, aka blonde based. So they're going to give you that coverage of that gray that you're looking for versus colors that sit on the edge of the color wheel are going to be more pure tone based and have less brown built into them. And again, at Bercato, we've done a really great job of making sure that the shades are placed on the color wheel to really illustrate the exact tonal contribution of each shade. So they've done a beautiful job of taking care of us as the colorist, especially in the back room when we just want to be able to take a quick look. I know my, in my salon we have this color wheel bolted to our back room wall. So you'll notice that there's some secondary tones in the line. So you'll see those double digit colors. Those double digit colors can do one of three things for you. They can enhance, subdue, or intensify. So if you open up the book, a really great example of that is eight stroke four three. When you see a color like this, this is a level eight. It's two parts of a stroke four, which is copper, and one part of a stroke three. So you can make that color if you wanted to, or it just comes in a tube and it's pre-done for you. The nice part about that is understanding the eight stroke four three, that second number is gonna do a couple of different things. In this situation, it's gonna enhance and it makes my copper look even a little bit brighter in a little bit bolder and a little bit more fashion forward. Or that second number can subdue. Great example of that is eight stroke seven one. It's a level eight stroke seven, which is that violet base brown and one part of a stroke one, which is ash base, which just cools it off just a little bit, making it a little bit more inky or a little bit more icy and cutting some of that warmth, but doesn't totally overcome it because it's not in equal proportions. Then you'll see numbers like five stroke five five. When the number's repeated, those are gonna be your intense over the top. I call them the three coats of nail polish situation, where you're gonna get that saturated, really bright, bold hair color. So again, the second number does one of three things. It either enhances, subdues or intensifies. It's always a two to one ratio so it gives you a good idea of what kind of influence that secondary color is going to have for you. When we talk about hair color there's really only two ways that we do hair color. We do addition color which is simply adding color to what we have. The target is same level or darker. We're not really affecting any underlying pigment to the hair and it's very simple and straightforward. Subtraction hair color is when we're trying to remove underlying pigment to the hair and then putting something over the top of it. So just keep that in mind when you're deciding what kind of hair color you want to do. Do you want to do addition or do, do you want to do subtraction hair color? So we're going to jump right into what each one of those is. When we talk about the underlying pigment in the hair. Again, keep in mind with Bricado, as long as you're staying within two levels of their natural 
level, you're not really going to see that underlying pigment overly exposed. But there is cases where you're going to want to make sure that you're aware of what the underlying pigment is going to be. So if you're moving three levels from where you currently live with that guest, you're going to want to keep this chart in your back room so it'll really help you understand what the underlying pigment is going to be. And you'll notice that the chart level three on up through seven is where the maximum amount of warmth or orange or gold is exposed. Past that it becomes a little bit lighter and easier to control. So just stick this chart in your back room and use it in one of these five ways in order to control your underlying pigment. So be aware of what you're doing. Again, if you're working within two levels, underlying pigment is not going to be as much of an influence for you. If you've moved three levels or more from where you're currently at, underlying pigment is going to influence you. Use this chart, work with the laws of complementary color. There's really only five ways that you can handle underlying pigment in the hair. The first way is to enhance, and these are usually those clients that want red or warmer results. So if I know I'm taking a client from a level three to a level seven and I look at the chart and the underlying pigment is going to be gold and I want to enhance that or make it brighter, I'm simply going to use something that, that has that same underlying pigment. I find that hair colorists make this mistake with red a lot where they don't, they make sure that the underlying pigment is overlifted or underlifted in the hair so it needs to be supportive of the red that's in there so you're going to actually add the same underlying pigment soften you're going to choose a shade that is closer to the center of the color wheel remember we said those colors closer to the center of the color wheel are more browner so by adding a layer of brown over the top of that underlying pigment it's simply going to soften and subdue you're still going to have a warm result but it'll subdue it we've all done this where we've used a neutral on something knowing that the underlying pigment is going to be warm you can simply subdue that by using something that's a little bit closer to the center of the color wheel. You can balance by choosing a shade that is in the same color family on the same side of the color wheel. So if I understand that same client that I'm lifting from a three to a seven, I'm lifting more than two levels, her underlying pigment is gold. I like that underlying pigment in the hair. I can balance it out by working on the same side of the color wheel, not necessarily adding the same underlying pigment, but I can work on that same side of the color wheel. I can control it. That's very simple. We do this all day long with complementary color by working straight across the color wheel. Neutralize and just create a neutral or natural result. The only challenge I have with this specific one when it comes to underlying pigment is I find that hair colorists rely on this thinking that they're creating a ashy or result. Especially right now in fashion, we're seeing a lot of ash results with the hair. And this really doesn't create an ash result. It creates a neutral or a balanced or a controlled result. What, if you want to create an ashy result, you need to use the overcome formula. So great example. The guest is a level four. We're lightening her to a level six, the underlying pigment is going to be gold orange. It's going to be pretty strong at that point. She wants an ashy result. Traditionally, the tube you choose is the tube you use. You would grab the ashiest level six that you have, six stroke one, or six stroke two would be a great option as well. And you'd use 20 volume because you're lifting two levels. In this situation, what I would suggest you do is use that same level, but just increase the volume by 10. So instead of using 20 volume, you're now going to use 30 volume. What will happen is your underlying pigment will lift a little bit lighter, but your overlying oxidizing color will give you the control that you're looking for, and it will overcome all of that warmth, giving your finished result an ashy color. So let me say that one more time. The guest starting level is a four. She desires to be the ashiest, coolest level six possible. What you're gonna do is use six stroke one or six stroke two and 30 volume to overlift their underlying pigment and reoxidize the color back over the top of it. Keeping in mind there's only two ways to overcome warmth. You need to go lighter or go darker. So by using that 30 volume instead of 20, I'm overcoming that result. So that just gives you an idea of underlying pigment. Again, I want to state with, with Bricado Color Project, as long as you're staying within two levels of their natural level, underlying pigment is not really going to be influential on you. Once you move three levels or more, underlying pigment is going to be an is going to be a consideration in your formulation and use this chart as a really great tool in your back room for you as well. 
and just keep in mind the bulk of what we do with hair color in the salon usually is within two levels so it becomes very easy so it minimizes the thought process that you have to do when you take a look at the lookbook the lookbook is really designed for you as the colorist. I love the fact that it has a three ring binder. I can pull those out, put them right up against the eyes and see how that hair color is going to look. But better yet, the swatches are actually done on level. So that's very key important. That means that this is a communication binder for your clients. We've gone so far in our salon as to have one at each station because I want to be able to pull that swatch book out and show it to my client and create that conversation. And that's very well thought through. In the past, we've been told, hey, don't show them the swatch book. It's not going to look like it anyway, and we just do this big guessing game. Well, this has been well thought through because the underlying pigment is already configured into the final result of the swatch. That's why if you're working within two levels, the result is going to look like the swatch every single time. It gives you predictable results. So use the swatch book as a tool for you to communicate with your guests on what the finished result is going to be. So you're going to see a couple of different things in, in the lookbook. The first key code next to certain colors you're going to see is this little gray dot that has a P and a D in it. That means that that shade comes in both permanent hair color and demi-permanent hair color. When you see just the D, that simply means that the shade comes in demi-permanent only. So you're going to notice the bulk of the shades come in permanent and demi, but there is some specific shades that only come in demi-permanent as well. All right, let's jump right into the Color Project Permanent, and we'll talk about each of the uses and share with our case studies as well. So with that being said, one of the first things that we need to talk about is the low ammonia odor technology. In the Bricado Color Project, one of the most unique things that's been developed is the, what we call LAO, or low ammonia odor technology, built into the Color Project. Premium micropigments that guarantee long-lasting results, and I'm going to expand upon that here in a moment. A moisture-rich base, so the, the three things that any good colorist looks for is going to be what is the alkalizer, what is the pigment base, and what is the actual base of the hair color itself, and I'm going to talk about each one of those. You have 70 permanent hair colors that are intermixable with each other, five permanent intensifiers that are actually color, we're going to get into that a little bit more, seven high lifts, and predictable results that match the swatch every single time with complete gray coverage. My favorite, non-progressive. So if this sits on five, 10 minutes too long, you're not all of a sudden gonna be a level to two levels darker than the hair color is. So let's start off by talking about LAO technology. The most offensive and irritating part of any hair color service for years in the salon has been the ammonia smell. It's the most irritating part. It gives the impression of being old fashioned. Um, unfortunately, ammonia has been perceived to create damage and harshness over the last 10, 15 years. And a lot of times, a lot of color companies will just mask the fragrance of ammonia by sticking another fragrance in. And usually, the lighter the level is, the stronger the smell is going to be. So I know in my salon, if we got confused on what our color bowls were when we were foiling, we would simply smell the bowl and it would tell us which bowl was which. That no longer is true because of LAO te technology. So one of the things to keep in mind is ammonia is the most dependable alkalizer for permanent hair color. In the research that Sam did in creating the line, he took a look at the opportunities of all alkalizers that were out there on the market. And the reality is ammonia being a gas is still the best choice and the most consistent and the most organic in the way that it works because it comes out of the tube and creates a pH to the hair and lifts the cuticle but naturally breaks down and becomes acidic over a period of anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes depending upon the product. So it returns that hair back to that nice beautiful 4.5 to 5.5 pH. That's the odor that we smell is that actually breaking down in the hair shaft. So what Sam did is, and the other part about ammonia is it rinses very easily from the hair. It's the most stable and predictable. A lot of times when you have secondary alkalizers to the hair, such as MEA, monoethanolamine, um, they can be unpredictable and they can create instant spikes in alkalinity and create a lot of scalp irritation, uneven lift, excess porosity, and they're just no bueno to the hair. Um, not good at all by any sense of the word. So 
again, ammonia becomes the best choice. We come back to it. Ammonia becomes the best choice when used responsibly. So what we did is develop the LAO base. The LAO base provides all the benefits of ammonia. The odor itself is actually trapped in the cream and it decreases the odor by 80% or more so that the client and the guests and the stylist are not gassed by ammonia. The actual odor itself is kept in the color, allowing it to still do the effectiveness of ammonia but not knocking you over. Now in my world, um, I know we just had to use some ammoniated color because of course I'm a salon owner and I have leftovers and we used some ammoniated color just this last Saturday and uh, the client commented and everybody in the back room, we're so spoiled by LAO technology. LAO technology really makes the color service come back to being a pleasant experience for our guests as well as for us living in, a, in a, an environment. So the second part that we have to talk about is the moisture rich base, the actual base itself, the emulsion based technology that's built into this. There's a couple of key things that happen. There's four different ingredients that are included into the base. There's maroon maru seed butter, macadamia seed oil, green tea seed oil, and palm kernel oil. Now remember when I was talking about the hair structure itself and the cortex of the hair being the macrofibers and microfibers and there's a intercellular binding material or a goo that holds those together inside the hair shaft. That's uncharacterized versions of protein and maru maru seed butter oil and macadamia seed oil penetrate through the cord cuticle of the hair into the cortex and mimic that in the hair. Since hair is not a living structure as it ages, that intercellular binding material actually dries out of the hair and causes it to have a heavy uptake of color, causes split ends, causes all sorts of, of color loss out of the hair shaft as well and increases the porosity of the hair. So the maru maru seed butter oil and the macadamia seed oil which is naturally essential fatty acids or amino acids which are building blocks of protein mimic that in the hair keeping it hydrated, soft and supple but better yet keeping your color durable and long lasting at the same time. Palm kernel oil is an oil that works topically on the surface of the hair and just beneath the cuticle of the hair. So those large damaged high porosity sites of the hair shaft are filled in using palm kernel oil and locking in the benefits of the macadamia and the maru maru seed butter oil topically on the hair giving it maximum hydration, incredible over the top shine. Now the key kicker here is the green tea seed oil and if for those of you that haven't used an antioxidant one of the explanations I like to, to say about an antioxidant is when we do hair color we use hydrogen peroxide or developer and it's basically elaborate water it has a hydrogen molecule to it that hydrogen molecule when it mixes with hair color is released and it becomes a gas that kind of just goes into the environment but also goes into the hair shaft and it remains there even if we shampoo it out of the hair, there's always a residual amount. When it's exposed to water, light, sunlight, heat, it reactivates all over again. We call it creeping oxidation. So if you've ever permed a client and their perm looks great and then they come back a week later and it looks a little bit frizzled and fried on the ends um, or a little bit yellow, that's an effect of that extra hydrogen molecule still being left in the hair and not being eradicated out. The green tea seed oil does that for you. It's a one of the strongest antioxidants on the planet is green tea, green tea for those of you that drink green tea and green tea eliminates the exogen, extra hydrogen molecule at the very end or any environmental issues and oxidants that come in contact with the hair causing durable long lasting hair color results. So the base is very well thought through with this. Now the base is also an emulsion. I really want to draw your attention to this because this is completely different than anything you've seen on the market before. Typically the base of hair color is cream, liquid, or gel. If you have a liquid hair color, um, obviously we all know what those are. They're very strong in ammonia typically and easy to apply. Gel hair colors we've seen. The bulk of us usually use cream hair color. Cream hair color has been the dominator of the market for years. Well, we have a new hybrid on the market and they're called emulsion based colors. Now emulsions actually use a combination of two ingredients that come together. You mix them together, you whip them together basically, and they create a third ingredient. Tip it, that's very common that that happens, but they're also, an emulsion means that they're allowed to keep their own identity 
between the two ingredients. So a great example of that is if you go to the Italian restaurant and you mix your oil and vinegar on the table and the oil eventually separates from the vinegar, it, you're gonna, that's an emulsion. So these ingredients are able to actually impart something to the hair because of the emulsion base and actually do something for the hair rather than just being a carrier for the hair. We can actually do something for the hair. These ingredients make up about 30% of the actual base of the hair color itself. And the reason I make a big deal out of that is the application of emulsion is slightly different than what you've traditionally seen and we're, we're going to get to that. And then as well as the pigment structure of the, of the color itself is actually predominantly oxidative hair color. So it's built in the hair shaft rather than on the hair shaft and they're much smaller micro pigmented dyes so they penetrate much further into the hair shaft giving you durability and longevity. So our formulation guidelines are pretty simple. The first rule of thumb is determine the natural level. You don't know where you're at until you have to figure out where you're at. Pull out that neutral swatch, click open that binder and hold it up to that hair. The one thing that I encourage people to take a look at is really spread the hair, work the hair into that swatch so you really get a good feel of exactly what it looks like and take different sections on the head so that you get an average of what the level is going to be because I find most hairdressers just stick it on the top of the head which is the most light exposed and the lightest hair. You really need to take a look at the top, the middle and the occipital area of the head. Step two is what percentage of gray are they? Are they in the 25% category, the 50-50 category or are they 70 plus? And then, of course, using the, the lookbook, where, what desired color result do you want? What do you want the finished result to be? And then choose the gentlest formula possible. Demice, a lot of times, is going to be more prevalent than you realize because you don't necessarily need lift in the formula. So let's take a look at some of those formulation guidelines. The first category that we have is our permanent hair color. And when you mix Bricado Color Project together, you mixing proportion wise traditionally is one part color project with one part rich cream developer. The volume of the developer is your fuel for lift so this determines your lift depending upon where you're starting at and where you want to go. I highly recommend you use a scale for the accurate measuring. If you don't have access to a scale use a beaker and use your displacement method of putting in your developer first and displace your developer on up to the line. I'm a stickler for using a scale, especially being a salon owner. Um, and a bowl and brush application is going to be ideal for this type of an, uh, application with the emulsion basis technology. So when you're deciding on processing and how long you process it, 10 volume hair color mixed with permanent color project, which typically you're going to be toning, is going to process for 25 minutes. You can use this as a guide in your back room for um, for timing if you want to just post this something like this in the back room this gives you a better idea you can use heat but heat's going to cut down your processing time by half to one-third again depending upon the texture of the hair and a little bit of heat goes a long way you really only need about 10 degrees over room temperature so I encourage people use heat as a tool not as a rule don't make everybody process under heat definitely know what the hair color looks like just processed at room temperature but if there's that moment where you have to play catch up a little bit or you need a little bit more deposit heat is a good is a choice and it is an option for you and this gives you a, a generic guideline that would process for 16 minutes with heat if you're darkening with 10 volume it's going to process again 25 minutes 16 minutes with heat tone on tone with 20 volume you're going to process for 30 minutes on average the color is going to process process for 30 minutes. 30 minutes if you're lifting one level, two levels, or three levels, you're going to process for 30 minutes. If you're doing high lift tint and you're looking for more than three levels of lift, that's going to be mixed in a one to two ra ratio and that processes up to 50, 50, five, zero minutes. All right. Your first gentlest formulating option with permanent hair color, one of, them, one of them, is to formulate with 10 volume. You can mix permanent hair color with 10 volume. This is best when you're staying with the same level or going darker. When you want up to one level of lift, so say I have a level 7 and I apply a level 7 on it, I'm going to get a level 7. But if I have a level 7 and I apply an 8 on it, I can, and it's fine enough, I can use 10 volume and get up to one level of lift. This exposes minimal, if any, contributing pigment in the hair. 
and ideal for gray blending. Small percentages of gray that are spread throughout the head, 10 volume is more than enough. Moving up to 20 at that point isn't, all, isn't going to be overly necessary. And again, mixed in equal proportions with Color Project Permanent. So here's a great case study of 10 volume. This is our, our model. She has fine hair, natural level four, no gray. Our target color is five stroke four three, a level five copper gold. We did color project five stroke four three and 10 volume scalp to ends. We processed it for 30 minutes and you can see the finished result. We have lifted her from a four on up to a five. She had fine hair, so we had that success there, Zipola gray, so it wasn't gonna be an issue for us. So you can see that warmth and the reflection and shine in her hair. So if you're formulating with 20 volume, typically this is gonna be for one to two levels of lift. This is your default. When in doubt, I always say think 20 volume and either raise your volume or lower your volume depending upon the texture and the levels of lift that you're looking at. This exposes warm contributing pigment, and ideal for gray coverage because this tells your artificial hair color molecule, I want you to expand as large as you can possibly get and maximize the opaqueness that I get to the color. Again, mixed in equal proportions. Let's take a look at our case study. So here's our model, medium texture, Again, the first thing I always encourage people to look at is what is the texture of the hair. Medium texture means she's probably going to be moderately easy to lift um, and probably going to have great uptake of color, very similar to the swatch. Natural level five, no gray. Our target color is six stroke four five, a level six copper red. We did color project six stroke four five and 20 volume in equal proportions on the scalp and six stroke four five and 30 volume on the ends all at the same time. It was all done together. Again, keep in mind there's keratinization and body heat. So there's less keratinization at the scalp and we have body heat. So 20 volume is a great choice, but I don't have that body heat and I have keratinization on the ends of this hair. So I need to use 30 volume to supply me a little bit more heat to bust through so that I get a consistent result. And you can see the result, scalp to ends, okay? Let's talk gray coverage. Oh, excuse me, 30 or 40 volume. When you're looking for three to four levels of lift, this is when you're gonna tap into your 30 or 40 volume with your permanent hair color. This exposes the most contributing pigment to the hair shaft. And typically you're gonna use 30 and 40 volume on the mid shaft and ends, especially when you're working with keratinized hair. You can also do this, color doesn't lift color predictably, but we know that color does shift color. If we're working on Bricado and we know where we're at and we're working with aged color, a lot of times we can use color to push out or shift pigment out of the hair and put new tonality in the hair. Again, you want to make sure you know exactly what you're working on. Clearly we can't take black hair and make it blonde using this trick, but we definitely can go let level on level or tone on tone in the hair shaft. Mixed again, equal proportions with color project. So here's our case study. Here's our model. She has fine hair, natural level six, no gray. She wants to be nine stroke three six. So a level nine gold with a soft beige background. That little bit of violet just tones down that intensity. But again, that secondary tonality just softens and mutes things a little bit. We did color project nine stroke three six and 30 volume at the scalp. Color project nine stroke three six and rich cream developer 40 volume on the mid lengths and ends and process the whole thing together. And you can see the finished result. Pretty dang close to the swatch because of our texture and integrity of the hair. All right. So gray coverage guidelines. Again, you, you heard me say earlier, a generic rule of thumb is match the percentage of neutral or natural in the bowl to the percentage of gray that you're experiencing. This little chart is beautiful to put in the back room. If you ha don't have any of these charts, just grab it from your sales consultant, um, the hair color guide. It's a beautiful big poster that you can put into the back room and it has all the swatch charts and it has all these mixing percentages and formulation guidelines on it. It's very well done. If you're working with small percentages of gray, 25% or less, really adding neutral to your formula isn't overly necessary. So the tube you choose is the tube you use. You're going to stay on tone. There's enough pigment in there to cover those little bits of gray. If you're 25 to 70% gray, 
somewhere about that 50, that's when you're going to have to really start taking it into consideration. So half of your formula is going to be target tone, half of your formula is going to be neutral or natural. If you're working on large percentages of gray, so 75 to 100 percent of the hair, this is when you want almost all or three quarters of your formula to be neutral or natural, that background brown, and then you can add your tonality on top of that, especially if you're aiming for that swatch result in the hair. So Matt, really, you only have the three different choices. Now the resistant or double pigmented formula is really for that client that has that buffalo coarse hair that has a hard time taking, that laughs when you put hair color on and it just stands up through the hair color. This should be the exception to the rule. Or if you have that client that wants a super opaque finish. I know I have a handful of guests that want a very flat, opaque, they don't want to see any highs and lows in the hair, they don't really give a flying rip about having any of that believability to the structure, they want opaque coverage. So a lot of times we'll do the double pigmented formula on them rather than having to have a whole nother series sitting on my shelf and we'll talk about each of those. So some guidelines with this is extend your processing time up to 45 minutes if you're having gray coverage and ideal is to stay again within two levels of their natural the pepper that's left in their hair if they have any left where are they at you're going to find that you're going to have better durability to the color if you can stay within those two levels the other thing is when you're doing a brush application on this use the brush application when you do a retouch we typically work the brush parallel to the hair shaft I'm going to suggest to you use a narrow brush and work across the hair shaft when you're doing your application. So you would part the hair, work across both sides of the shaft, and that physical movement working across the shaft back and forth a little bit is actually going to abrade the cuticle a little bit and shove the color into the hair shaft. So you've got to get a little bit more physical with it. The other thing you can do is do your retouch application and just come back as you drop your section and just kind of seal over the color so that you give it a moment to soften and then seal the color back over the top of it. And again, keep in mind those multi-pigment bases, such as stroke 36, stroke 7, stroke 75, 47, all of those have that stroke 7 built into them or that multi-pigment brown built into them. Sometimes they make having to add neutral to your formula not overly necessary, just for a little bit more of a colorful experience that's a little bit more believable, especially if you're getting bored. That stroke 7 works beautifully as a pitch hitter. So here's a generic example of gray coverage on a guest. This client has medium textured hair. She's a natural level six. She's about 50% gray. The bulk of her gray is through the front and then it got less than the back. Her desired color is six stroke three, so a level six gold. We applied six stroke zero and six stroke three 50-50 because she's 50% gray. So half of my formula was six stroke zero and the other half was six stroke three and equal proportions of 20 volume developer on her scalp. We did the same formula using 30 volume on our mid lengths and ends because this was a virgin application and we processed it all together and processed this for 30 minutes. And you can see the finished result. So nice, soft, believable, gold brown. We got the gray coverage. We still have believability going on in the hair as well, but we got, we got gray coverage. Then you have those coarse resistant clients. You can use the resi coarse, tenacious, resistant gray double pigmented formula. When you do this, this again, I can't stress to you, this should be the exception to the rule, not the rule. If you're finding that you're doing this on absolutely everybody, you're probably doing some sort of application issue, um, which we're going to talk about extensively. You might want to check your application or your formulation. This should really be a small handful of your guests that see you in the salon. You'll do two parts of Color Project Permanent and one part of 30 volume rich cream developer. Any formula can be double pigmented. Same rules apply and you can process up to 45 minutes. The only thing that I do tell people is this is not a formula you want to use on mid shaft and ends of the hair if they have color already on top of them. So if you're refreshing, this is going to be heavily pigmented and it's going to have a tendency to be very opaque. So great example case study formula. Here's our guest. She has coarse hair, a ton of it. Natural level 5, 70% gray. We wanted a level seven with highlights. So our formula was two parts of seven zero and seven seven seven. The bulk of our formula was seven zero with a, a little bit of seven 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 because it's 70% gray and one part of 30 volume. 
and we applied that to the scalp. On her mid lengths and ends, because she had previous color already on the mid lengths and ends, we did seven stroke seven seven on its own, mixed in equal proportions of 30 volume, because we're using color to shift color. So we adjusted the formula at the scalp to two parts color and one part 30 volume, and the equal parts of color and 30 volume for the mid lengths and ends just to shift out old pigment. Process that for 45 minutes. While that was all processing, at the same time, right over the top of the color, we did some cream lights balayage right over the top of the color while it was all processing. Maybe, there we go. So you can see the finished result. We have maximum opaque coverage at the scalp, a little bit lighter and brighter and warmer on the ends with the balayage highlights as well. Over the top of that seven stroke seven base, just dramatically altered her world. All right, let's talk high lift. These are available in seven shades. They're denoted by an 11. That doesn't mean that's a level that we would lift a guest to. That just denotes that this is a high lift series. So they have maximum quantity of ammonia in them for lift, as well as maximum control of tonality as well. These are designed to give three to four levels of lift depending upon the texture. You mix these two parts 30 volume for fine hair and two or two parts 40 volume for everybody else. These are going to process 45 to 60 minutes. And to color balance the ends on somebody that's had a previous high lift tint, you're going to use a demi, demi color on the mid lengths and ends because there's no need to expose. You would definitely never want to use these as toners because they have maximum color deposition to control that underlying pigment that lifts typically with high lift tint. So here's a case study. Here's Trixie before. Trixie has fine hair. This is part of the trick to high lift tint because I know a lot of us have been um, not had success with high lift tint. So a couple things you need to look for is eye color. They need to already have a, a light eye color to begin with. It's very rare that a brown eyed client is going to lift very easily. She has fine hair. She's a natural level eight. She has no gray and she's going for pale blonde. Our formula is high lift 11 stroke one, which is going to be our 11A ash and 30 volume on the scalp and 11 stroke one and 40 volume on the mid lengths and ends. Again, it's all applied simultaneous to the hair shaft. And we process that all 45 minutes and you can see the finished result. Nice, pale, controlled, pastel tones. Really um, what, what brought me to play with Bricado on a regular basis was the high lift tints. They're really insanely incredible on the hair. Personal favorite, 11.1, 11.6. Either one of those are my personal favorites in the hair shaft. This is 11 stroke one. All right, continuing on, we have intensifiers. Now in the permanent family, these can do a couple of different things for you. These can be mixed with your color to intensify or subdue. And it's very worth noting here that these are pure toned. There's no brown involved and they are permanent for permanent hair color. So they actually have the exact same base, the exact same alkalizer as the rest of the hair and their oxidative pigment built into it. So what most people don't understand is when you have an intensifier with a color line, it's a direct dye that's just being stuffed inside the hair color to make it more durable, or excuse me, more intense, but it's not quite as durable. This is actually permanent hair color on its own that can be used in your color as color and it'll be durable. So your permanent goes with permanent. You can add up to 25% of your formula with these to maintain the quality of the color. After 25% the intensifier begins to take over. We've actually in our salon I know we've done um, intensifiers where we just take the intensifier plus developer and use it on its own on the on the hair just to get a bold bright result. So you can mix these with developer and use them alone on previously lightened hair to get those intense fashion shape results. So 011 blue, 033 gold, 044 copper, 055 red, and 066 violet. Yes, you can create those blue shades on that previously lightened hair and be very, very durable. This has been an incredible choice. So let's take a look at what that takes, looks like. Here's an example of a case study. This guest is coarse. She's a natural level four, no gray. 
her target color is six stroke five five with zero five five. Now it's worth noting that she has a little bit of previous old demi color on that mid lengths and ends. So her formula for this is color project six stroke five five, and we did half and half. So zero five five intensifier as well with ten volume on her scalp. We did the same formula but with 40 volume on the mid lengths and ends because we, we want to shift out some of that old color on the ends as well as she has coarse hair and obviously we're trying to lift a little bit, um, lift quite a bit with her hair and get maximum vibrancy to that hair and enhance that underlying pigment that's going to be with the hair shaft. Okay? Process that all 45 minutes and you can see the finished result. You can see here because we did a 50-50 split the intensifier takes over a little bit and it gives you that bright vibrant result that you're looking for. All right, let's continue on and talk about application. Now I mentioned earlier that application is going to be vitally important for you and this is really where you want to pay attention because this is emulsion based technology. Emulsions are the thickest version of a liquid that you can possibly get before they actually become a solid. So when pressure is applied to an emulsion, it liquefies from where it's currently at. So you want to apply a color project to clean dry hair. And with a first time version application, you saw some of the case studies where we were doing lower volume at the scalp, higher volume at the ends, keep in mind keratinization. When you're doing a retouch, you want to just focus that right there on the retouch and then color balance using a gentle or formula on the mid lengths and ends. And a proper application is crucial. I cannot stress this enough. So here's a great example of why. Typically, most of us, when we apply hair color, you can see the color brush here where we're applying. You bend those, those fibers in, with the hair color brush, and you're almost putting color on and wiping it simultaneously off. So I can't stress enough because when pressure is applied to an emulsion, it liquefies and spreads. You're basically putting it on and wiping it off. So a better best practice application is to do the tap and seal. So when you apply, you want to tap the product right onto the hair and you kind of want to seal over the surface of it. So lay your arm down a little bit flatter to the hair shaft and a little bit more parallel. You're going to use just the smallest amount more color. So don't go crazy with this. Five grams more color, five grams more developer, and you just want to make sure that you apply it focus right on that spot and really encapsulate that hair fiber and it doesn't require a lot of pressure to get it to do its job like we're typically used to with um, cream hair colors. Very, very, very important and crucial. Let's take a look at some of the single inventory options that you have with permanent hair color. So say you're a booth renter or you just simply don't want to have to be bothered with carrying a demi and a permanent hair color as well, there is some single inventory options. The first option is a gentle semi-permanent. We make a zero stroke zero clear and this is designed to be mixed with your permanent hair color and the activating cream to create a semi-permanent result. No lift, phenomenal for color balancing in the hair or for doing try on color or for really sheer tonalities to the hair. So one part color, one part zero zero clear and one part demi activating cream. This is seven, about a seven volume. Okay, very important that you use the cream with this. You're going to get a gentle, semi-permanent to the hair. For those of you that used to be Cottis users back in the day, this would probably be as close as you get to a Fervidol Brilliant. The second choice is to do a durable demi. With a durable demi, you're going to use perfectly clear. And perfectly clear, mixed in one part color, one part perfectly clear, and one part demi activating cream is going to be your durable demi to the hair. So this is going to give you a little bit more opacity to the hair, a little bit more durability to the hair, and um, you're going to use this for color refreshing. So I always tell people, how do I decide? I call it the um, DTS, look for depth, tone, and shine. If I look at the ends of the hair and the depth is missing, and the tone is missing, and the shine is missing, I'm probably going to want to color balance or color refresh with durable demi. If I look at the hair and the depth is great, but the tone is slightly off or the shine is slightly off, a gentle semi-permanent is going to be really great. If I'm looking at just the shine factors off and I maybe have a little bit of tonal fadage 
and I need a little bit more opacity, then my true demi permanent is going to be a really great choice. So you have all sorts of options there, whether you want to maximize your inventory and not have demi, or whether you want to use the demi in conjunction with. Let's take a, case, a look at a case study. Here's our model. She has fine hair. Never colored her hair a day in her life. I love doing this one. Natural level seven. She wanted something that was going to age and fade out of her hair because she eats granola and hay every single day of her life and has lived healthy and doesn't want better living through chemistry. Zero percent gray. Her target color is eight stroke four three, so a level eight copper gold. We did eight stroke four three copper gold color project permanent with equal parts of demi clear, zero zero clear, and activating cream, equal proportions, 30, 30, 30. Scalp to ends, processed it for 25 minutes. And that's our finished result. Shiny, happy, healthy, not lifted hair color. I can't stress that enough. Not lifted hair color. Now the fun part about this is after this shoot, about two weeks later, um, she came back in to get this hair color permanent because she had so much attention. She's now chemically dependent and of course that's how we love our clients. So this is a great way to start a guest into hair color obviously and then move them into more permanent hair color as well. All right, let's jump to demis. So the second tool in your toolbox is demis. We have our permanent hair color where we're looking to do subtraction hair color. It's a phenomenal tool lift or we're doing gray coverage or we want to gentle it down and make a, a, a sheer demi out of it. This is our true demi. Now the one thing I want to stress before we talk about demis is demi in French means half. It is a weak version of permanent hair color. So what we just looked at as durable demi is a weak per version of permanent hair color. Color Project Demi, the actual liquid demi itself, is much more colorful and has a lot stronger deposition of hair color on its own. So there is some value and some use to having it in your toolbox on its own. So let's take a look at where we would use demi. These have the same premium micropigmented uh, results that we had with permanent hair color. The alkalizer here, because you need an alkalizer to soften and get past that cuticle in the hair, is ammonia-free. It's, a, a, it's called AMP, amino methyl propanol. And if you're taking a look at secondary alkalizers, amino methyl propanol is your best choice because it is the least um, out, least aggressively alkaline. It doesn't have an alkalizing spike to the hair. Um, you don't need a ton of it. It's the most stable. It's absolutely incredible for leaving the hair happy, healthy, and shiny. And if the biggest comment that we get from hair colorists as they're using demi-permanent hair color or using our demi-permanent hair color compared to what everything else that's on the market that traditionally doesn't use amino methylpropanol or AMP, it's that the quality of the hair and the shine is absolutely over the top incredible and it lasts for an intended period of time. So there is zero lift to the hair. So there's a full array of 27 demi-permanent hair colors. There's five demi-shears, four intensifiers, and the demi matches the permanent. So you can do great coverage with the permanent hair color and color balance the mid-lengths and ends using a demi-permanent hair color for intense shine, et cetera, et cetera. Blends gray, small percentages of gray. It, well, blends small percentages of gray, non-progressive. So if you leave this sit on a little bit too long, um, you're going to find that it doesn't go a level to two levels darker or suck up in those high porosity areas of the hair shaft. So, and really that was one of the big tests in our salon is the, the non-progressive factor built into it. It actually prevents damage because it seals the cuticle of the hair and leaves it in intense shape. And clients will constantly notice that their hair is detangled and smooth. So a lot of times I'll just do a clear on a guest just to seal the cuticle of the hair and make it happy, healthy, and shiny and give them a lot of combability in the hair shaft. So when you take a look at the color wheel for demi, it's slightly different because when you're doing demi hair color, you're doing addition hair color. I'm adding to what's happening in the hair because I'm not creating lift. So it's the brown isn't necessarily as important to me as the tonal direction. So you'll notice that there's tonal that it's placed according to tonal directions. A great example is the neutral series. Obviously a 2N is going to look a little bit bluer than say an 8N is. So it shows you what the tonal direction is going to be. Just give it a good visual when you're looking at it. And it you typically uses the Americanized system, but the same name and number system applies as well. All right, so here's your demi tools. These are great for your first time color shy guests, 
staying the same level or going darker, enhancing their natural color or tone, um, those quick glazes where you just want to get it on and change the tonality of the hair, incredible for toners, or what we call our gray coverage for men, works really well, sidebar for that for two seconds. Um, seven zero and seven stroke one is the f most phenomenal coverage for men for gray for gray coverage um, when using the demi permanent. It works really well. Incredible for low lighting because remember we talked about that deposition of color is a little bit more intense with the demi even though you don't have that ability to lift in the hair. So you get phenomenal low lighting, gray blending, color balancing. This is also our repigmentizer. So it really addresses a lot of the tools that are needed in our toolbox. So you can use this on its own straight from the bottle mixed with your activator with your activating liquid. Notice we're using the liquid here. We use the cream with the permanent system to create a demi, durable demi. Here you only want to use the liquid with liquid because otherwise you use the cream with it you're going to find that you get a lovely viscosity issue that goes on with the hair shaft. But again like we said the deposition of the color is pretty intense so if you find that you need to shear it up a little bit that's absolutely okay that's really what perfectly clear is designed to do this chart again is in the hair color guide as well it'll give you an idea of exactly how to dilute it there's the full strength is on its own the maximum dilution which is one and a half parts clear to one part of color Moderate dilution is equal proportions, and then the minimum dilution is going to be one and a half parts color to half a part of the clear shine. So you really, with the demi, can create any tool that you want, and you can really create the depth or intensity that you want to the color. Here's a great case study of just demi permanent. This guest is medium texture, natural level six, no gray. Her target color is six stroke seven five. So we're doing level on level here. Now, what I want you to notice about this is 6 stroke 75 is a level 6, two parts of a violet based brown, and one part of a red. So it is brown red. So it actually, because of that brown base, softens the warmth that's in her hair, but still leaves it reflective and shiny. So our we, we mixed up 30 grams of 6 stroke 75 and 30 grams of activating liquid on dry hair, scalp to ends, and processed it 20 minutes. No lift, deposit only and you can see the finished result. Shiny, reflective, still has warmth shining through, but it muted out some of that brassy tone that's going on in the hair. Has lots of deposition to color, and you can see how it just filled in those gaps on the hair. All right, let's take a look at the two tools that you have in the demi-permanent family. You have the zero stroke zero clear and the perfectly clear. Zero stroke zero clear is meant for a couple of different things as a glaze and a color sealer on its own when you're talking about demi permanent. You can mix it with your permanent to create durable demi, but you would not want to mix this with your demi permanent color. This is phenomenal for neutralizing curl interrupted if you're doing curl interrupted smoothing services in your salon. It has a very low pH to it. The pH is 4.5. This does not have the amino methyl propanol base to it. So it's very acidic in nature and it slams that cuticle shut and leaves it very, very shiny. You can use this on its own and apply it to the hair and process it the whole time for happy, healthy, shiny hair. Uh, I have a lot of salons that just want to make the hair shiny and take responsibility for it. Zero, zero clear should be your friend for that. Or you can mix it with the activator and push it a little bit further into the cuticular layer of the hair as well. You can also, one of my favorite tools, is add actives to this to just intensify and pop the shine and use it as a treatment. I find um, one of the things that's very important is in the salon that the hair colorist takes responsibility for all of the hair. So when you're retouching the hair, regardless of whether you feel like there's tonality needed on the ends of the hair or not, which you'll find with Bricado, a lot of times you don't, just applying zero, 00 Clear works really, really well for that. And like we said, it can be used on its own perfectly clear intensity diluter has a little bit of a different uh, spin on it. This is intended to be mixed with your demi color to dilute it down so that you can shear up the tone tonality of the color as well. And the demi, this on its own has the amp built into it. So it has that amino methylpropanol. So it has that alkalizing pH that's necessary to work in conjunction with the demi-permanent color and to maintain that viscosity as well. So two different tools used in two different ways.
One of the other tools that you have is the shears. A lot of times clients talk about the intensity to our color being a little bit too much for toning. So we created five super sheer shades. These have 50% less intensity. These can be used as toners or glosses. They could be mixed with your core demi lines as well. You have S9NB, S9GB, S10G, S10N, and S10GC. Golden copper. Sorry, I use numbers, so reading letters just threw me off for a second there. So you have golden copper, neutral, gold, golden beige, and neutral beige. So you have your NBs um, all the way up to your G series. So let's take a look at what this looks like on the hair. Here's our case study. This is Natalie before. Natalie has very fine hair, a ton of it, but fine. She, This hair is natural. There's not a stitch of color on her hair. When she walks outside, this is what she walks around the world with, is this beautiful blonde hair. But she feels like it's a bit too warm. She just wants to cool it off without really being committed to hair color. Shears are perfect for this. So our formula wise, we just use 10 stroke zero, the shear 10 stroke zero, with activating liquid on dry hair from scalp to ends, processed it for 20 minutes. And you can see how it just balances out and finishes the result without lifting her hair color. You can still see the dimension going on at the scalp of her natural level nine, lightening out to the end. Shears are a phenomenal tool for you. The demi intensifiers are, again, what we talked about earlier. These are mixed with demi color to intensify or subdue warmth. Just like within the permanent line, they're pure tone for ultimate creativity and versatility, but they are demi color with demi. So you want to put liquid with liquid. These are oxidative hair color. They do have the amp in them as well, so they will perform on their own just like demi-permanent hair color. Add 25% of them to your demi-permanent color for, to intensify the result, over 25% of it being in your color, and the shade, the, the intensifier takes over control and begins to really pop and become all, all about the intensifier at that point. These can be mixed with activator and used alone on blonde and previously lightened hair for intense results. We use these a lot when we want to create those bright reds on the mid lengths and ends of the hair. So you have gold, 0 stroke 3, 3, 0 stroke 4, 4 copper, 0 stroke 5, 5 red, and 0 stroke 1, 1 blue for the ash controller. And yes, if you put that on previous, that 0 stroke 1, 1 on previously lightened hair, if you get it pale enough, you will get blue. Keep in mind, because a lot of times people run back to the salon and this is the first one that they want to try is bleach up some hair strands and do this. Keep in mind the laws of color still work. So if you do not get that hair pale enough and you leave a little bit of yellow left in the hair, yellow and blue make green. So make sure that you're really working on the correct underlying pigment that corresponds with those tones when you do that. All right, here's a great case study for this. This is Mackenzie before and Mackenzie's hair is fine. She's a natural level nine copperish. No gray, obviously she's two years old, so she can't have any. Our goal is for nine stroke four three with an intense panel of color in the very front. So we did nine stroke four three and activating cream on her whole head, but in the very front panel right under her fringe, we did nine stroke four three with about three grams, 12 grams of nine stroke four three and three grams of zero stroke four four intensifier and the corresponding 15 grams of activating liquid process it together. So you'll see the color without the activator next to the color with activator. And you can see that pop of color, how it really intensifies the result and just makes it shiny, happy, and healthy in the hair. All right. For gray blending guidelines, again, the same rules, match the percentage of gray to the percentage of neutral in your bowl. This is a great little chart, especially if you're doing demi-permanence. If you're 25% or under, you're really not going to have to add neutral or natural to the series. If you're 25% or over, you're probably going to have to have a 50-50 result. If you're 75% or more, almost all of your color, at least three quarters of your color, or one and a half parts of your natural series to half a part of your Bricado color demi. Again, your gray will determine the natural needed in your formula. And I want to stress here the word gray blending. So yes, your client may walk out looking covered, but the durability of the color is going to look like gray blending over a period of time. So if she's expecting that same coverage four weeks later, you might be disappointed because again, keep in mind, this is demi-permanent. Its job is to blend. 
<clears throat> so here's some processing guidelines for that. Um, if you're working on normal hair, process room temperature 20 to 30 minutes. Resistant or you want some more vibrancy, you can put them underneath a warm dryer for 15 minutes and let them cool down anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes. So for a total of 30 minutes, warm them up for 15 cool them down for 15 and you're going to notice the intense results. If you're really looking for blending aka a little bit more coverage, that 15-15 underneath a warm dryer is really going to be your best choice. We do this one a lot here at my salon. We do 15 minutes with heat, 15 minutes to cool for a total of 30 and we get phenomenal results from it over and over and over again. All right, Let's talk about repigmentizing for a second. This one again is in your hair color chart and demi-permanent is used for repigmentizing the hair. So when, the, when you're going from light to dark, if your guest is more than two levels from where they're currently at, so say she's a 10 and she's going to an eight, you don't need to repigmentize as long as the quality of the hair is good. If you're going from a 10 to a 7, you need to repigmentize and you can follow this, this hair color repigmentizing chart. These are designed the underlying pigments are of these are designed so that the overlying color can overcome it. So what you're going to do is you're going to mix your repigmentizer in equal proportions with water following the chart, lightly apply them to the hair, make sure that you're not saturating, just lightly apply them to the lightened sections of the hair and towel them off and apply your permanent color over the top of them. Okay, And it gives you, it, all of that color bonds together itself and gives you long-lasting durable results. It's incredible. Again, one of the major reasons that we love working with Bricado is that one-step repigmentizing. You don't have to wait for anything to process. You don't have to rinse anything. Just apply it with water, permanent color over the top of it, and you're good to go. One of the support pieces that is used with Demi is our color refresher. And the color refresher sells on average for $16.95 in the salon. And this is a really I encourage salons to create a color refresher section in their retail area in the front of their salon and it maintains color between visits a try on color you're gonna pour in and you can see the side of this five ounce bottle is segmented so you're gonna pour in five ounces of constructor which is a pure foaming protein treatment to the hair pour it up to the four ounce line and then one ounce of demi permanent color up to the line and then shake that up and send that home with your guests and what they're going to do with this is they're going to use this to keep their color fresh over a period of time so mix it in the bottle leave it in for five minutes in the shower and rinse it really well you may find that you don't need a re uh, conditioner following this because of the, the constructor that's built into it pulls it into the hair shaft leaves the hair incredibly shiny if you're not doing these with your guests and you're not t sending them home with your guests you're really doing a disservice the durability of their color is insanely incredible when you send them home with this can't tell you I can't go on enough about color refreshers Let's hit our lights and then we'll wrap this bad boy up. The lights, there's two different tools in your toolbox when you're trying to create light in the hair. The first is my personal favorite, cream lights. Cream lights is actually designed specifically for freehand light and lightening techniques such as balayage, ombre, um, or just simply painting the hair. It's a beautiful tool for that. Extra thick for the perfect placement. So it doesn't imprint upon the hair that it's surrounding. So if you lay the, put this on a section of hair and lay hair against it, it's not actually going to imprint upon the, the hair that's around it. Essential oils that protect the hair. And you're going to want to make sure this is only designed to lift two to five levels. It's really not designed to lift up to seven levels. So really make sure you're picking it for the correct client. And this mixes with two parts of Rich Cream Developer. And make sure once you it's lifted to where you want it that you shampoo it out of the hair once the process is complete before you tone because of the oil factor it does repel color over the top of it. Let's finish off with our powder lights. This is our gentle blue lightener. It's all-purpose dust-free lightener that can be used on or off of the scalp. It has a fresh fragrance to it. You, you want to use 20, 10 or 20 volume on the scalp, 10, 20, 30, or 40 volume off of the scalp. Essential oils and collagen protect the hair, and it's great for all for all techniques. The blue base gives you control of warmth. My personal favorite mixes with two parts of cream, rich cream developer, and process accordingly. And 
you want to make sure obviously that you shampoo and complete it. I always tell people please finish this off with a constructor afterwards to change the charge of the hair shaft. Here's our case study of the powder lights. Here's our model before Maddie. She has fine hair, natural level 7, no gray. Our desired color is platinum, 10 stroke 8. We did 10 volume on the scalp with powder lights and 20 volume on the ends. We have put her under steam heat for about 20 minutes just to make sure that we create that moist environment and then we toned her with 10 stroke 8 durable demi so that perfectly clear with 10 stroke 8 worked really well on this and you can see the finished result. Pale, pastel, phenomenally lifted, incredible shine to the hair. And then of course everything should be finished off with Vibracolor. Um, when you're done with permanent hair color, you just simply want to rinse and condition either using Vibracolor conditioner, Vibracolor treatment, or constructor. These have sunflower seed extract in them which helps elongate the life of your color, broccoli seed oil for incredible shine, paraben and paba free, sulfate free obviously, the fade prevention system, this is hair color insurance for your hair. Send your clients home with Vibracolor to maintain this for home. All right, Mr. Gary, that's my presentation. That was awesome, Jesse. Thank you. Um, we appreciate everybody being involved and everybody's attendance. We will stay on the line and we'll continue to be available to answer text questions. Um, if you'd like to ask a verbal question of Jesse, raise your hand and I'll try opening your mic and see if you can ask, see if we can ask questions. If not, we can certainly answer text questions um, as long as as long as you're interested and as long as you're